Join us today on Issues and Answers as we welcome back author and grief counselor Karen Nicola, and we were going to be talking about grief work. Hello, I'm Michelle A. Quinn, and we welcome you once again to Issues and Answers. Today, we're going to cover a very fascinating topic. We're speaking with author and grief counselor, Karen Nicola. She has a ministry called Comfort for the Day, and she's written a book called Comfort for the Day, which is actually something we're going to talk about more in this program, because it is a journal, and we're going to be speaking to the idea of working through our grief, things that we can do, positive steps that we're allowing God to do in our life. And of course, it all has to do with trusting God and knowing that His Word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Mm -hmm. Karen, we are so thankful to have you back again. Thank you, and Shelley. And we've enjoyed this. This is the third in a series that uh, of programs that we've done with you, talking to what is grief, speaking about the grief spiral, the different stages and phases and of grief that not the typical five stage thing we hear about because that doesn't really apply. But um, today you wanted to call this program Grief Work. And that was kind of a catchy title, caught me off guard. Let's just jump right into Grief Work. Good, because grief work needs to be jumped into. And most people don't have a clue that they have any part to play in their grieving. That it's just something that happens at them, or it happens from within inside, they're just going through this emotional roller coaster ride, and it's just what it is. And, and there's no understanding that we can take back some control in our life when all control has been stripped away. Mm. And part of that regaining control is actually making intentional, purposeful decisions of cooperating with God's healing for our broken heart. So one of the illustrations I like to use is if, if on my flight here to 3ABN, I fell all down off the airplane and broke my leg somewhere in the, in the runway or something like that, and I came hobbling in and had never gone to the hospital to have it treated, because I've, I've got to get here to 3ABN, I need to get this taping done, and so I'm here, I've got this broken leg, and then I go home and I never really attend to it. Oh my. Is my life going to be affected for Absolutely. the rest of my life? Yes, Absolutely. it will be. And it's something that everybody can see from the outside, now I have a damaged, broken leg. Amen. But what we can't see is when people have a damaged, broken heart. Amen. And we go through life not attending that broken heart, just like I wouldn't attend a broken leg, would be absurd. But it's what we do. You know, there's something, I don't think I can articulate this, but when you said that, I thought, yeah, you have to go back and reset the leg. You go through physical therapy. And when we're grieving, it's like you have to set the reset button, like you do on a computer almost. You've got to go back and intentionally do some things like the physical therapy for the leg, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And we all know, I mean, a torn rotator cuff is another example. Yes. You know, someone's arm and they've got to have the surgery and then the physical therapy begins. So when that physical therapy begins, is that Painful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it it's is. very painful. So first of all, I'd like for our viewers to understand that grief work is painful. I'm not going to pretend and say, oh, it all gets better. It's so nice. It's so easy. You can do this. No. But what we need to understand is the value of pain. And if we, let me ask you this real quickly. If we don't address the pain, I mean, because you, mm. I think the reason people don't deal with it is because it is painful. Uh, some people won't go through counseling because it's too painful to bring up the, the memories of the past. Um, I'm thinking of an individual right now who lost her husband 
10 years ago, 11 years ago, and she stuck mm -hmm. in a grieving cycle. Mm -hmm. and, and you just see this roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So someone like her has never really let, allowed God to he, apply the balm of Gilead. Yeah. And so what you're saying is this person, I mean, if we don't go through the painful experience of cooperating with God to receive healing, then we're gonna be hobbling around with a leg that's, that's out like this. Uh, and essentially you're gonna be stuck in pain for years to come. Yeah, so we just need to ask ourselves, uh, do I want to, to live the rest of my life handicapped, hampered, damaged from my grief experience? Or do I want to live the rest of my life mm. whole, restored, like and as God would call me to His healing? And, you know, whether we're Christians or not, a lot of people choose the, because of ignorance, choose the handicapped, hurtful place to live the rest of their lives because they ignorantly are unaware that there is healthy grief work that can take them through to a restored, healthy life again. Both ways, our lives will forever be changed. I just have to say to those who are watching today, many spouses, many married couples find that there are things that they do that trigger a certain response from their spouse and they get so confused by this. I hope you're paying close attention to what we're talking about today because typically speaking, when there is a trigger point in someone's life, it is connected to some kind of grief in the past with which they have not dealt. That's right. And as you say that, hurting people hurt people. Yeah. So if our broken heart remains broken, charred, has rough edges, and we just keep living through our life without doing the grief work to That's let good. the healing occur, we will be a hurting person who hurts people. Yeah. And it just happens. We okay, so what is this grief work? So this grief work, first of all, is to say, okay, if I can in endure physical pain to restore an arm in physical therapy or a leg in physical therapy, can I endure emotional pain? You bet we can. Because the Lord never leads us to something that's beyond our capacity. Mm -hmm. And it is His purpose to heal the broken heart. But He understands that it is painful along the way. And so He brings the Holy Spirit to comfort us. He comforts us through His Word, through Scripture. And that's what I think is so important about the book that I wrote. This is a guided, Scripture-guided grief recovery journal. This is not about me and my loss and how I process grief. This becomes the reader's story of how God's Word is helping them heal their brokenness. Now let me ask you, is this the process, when you lost your son at three and a half years to leukemia, um, and this was 30 years ago, did you know, were you already, did you employ this process or was this something that you learned later? I absolutely, I had already, <laughs> interestingly enough, I began journaling when I became pregnant with him. Okay. So I had been journaling for a couple of years. And the habit in my journal writing was to address my journal entries to God. I, I wanted Him to hear about my joys, my fears, my concerns, my, you know, throughout my pregnancy and, and what it was life to, like to give Him birth. And certainly when He first was diagnosed with leukemia, I journaled and journaled um, my broken heart, you know, what's happening, my questions, our faith crisis. So I had had some experience with journaling, but I really want um, audi the audience to understand that Journaling does not mean that you have to be a writer, okay? Yeah. You don't have to write anything in perfect handwriting. You don't have to use perfect spelling. You don't have to use grammar. All that we are doing is that we are releasing from our mind and our heart the things that would twirl round and round and round and round and round and round until we would get them out. And I know there's no science for this, but I really believe that the amount of time it takes to get a thought down the arm, in the hand, and written on paper 
leaves space for the Holy Spirit to follow and heal. You know, it's interesting. I, I have a teaching called Pressing into His Presence that I teach. This is where God changed my life. Was mm -hmm. t I learned to journal my prayers and addressing as if they were letters to God mm -hmm. and they were prayers to God. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that I found in journaling is that you are so much more focused. You're focused on God. You're, you're not having all of the distractions and the interruptions. The, the process of having to write it, I actually typed mine for, for many, many years, you know. And, mm -hmm. But the process of writing, mm -hmm. you're in, you are employing all of your senses mm -hmm. and then it opens you up to be able to hear the, the impression of the still small right. voice upon That's your right. mind. That's exactly right. And so when I talk about grief work, it is an intentional, purposeful activity that we as mourners say, either this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, I'm going to do my grief work. I'm going to sit down either with Karen's book or my own empty journal or God's word by myself. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write about what is happening to me right now. I'm going to write about the questions, the pain, the anger, the regret. I'm going to write about the acceptance, the, the fears. I'm going to write about whatever it might be, the experience that we're experiencing grief right now. And that's my grief work. I'm going to let that exit my mind and heart and body and find its place on paper. One of the advantages, you know, a lot of people say, well, just go talk to a friend about it. And that's beautiful. And if we have those kind of friends, what a gift that is. But as soon as the word leaves my mouth, it comes back into my ear. When a word leaves my body, it stays on that paper. And so if I am haunted by guilts and regrets, if I'm haunted by, a, by a, an image, the physical image of, of my son committing suicide or uh, of being there at the scene of an accident, those trauma, traumatic, violent, um, unexpected deaths, I can put that out on paper and it leaves me for a season. It's very cathartic. Yeah. It's not that it might not come back, but in its return, I know where to take it again. And I can take it again and again. And that's the grief work. If I'm not willing to do the grief work, where does the grief go? And you know, to be honest, there's very few people who have the kind of friend that they will tell everything to. We all, sure. we all have are very good about verbal camouflage. You know, you might tell a portion of it, but you're leaving out what is most painful. Whereas if you're addressing God, you can get down to this. And sometimes you don't even recognize what's most painful until you actually do begin to journal. Start the writing. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and the importance of addressing it to God rather than just blindly saying, well, today it's da-da-da and I'm experiencing this and that and the so forth. By addressing it to God, we are entrusting it to the only power that can mm -hmm. do something about it. And so David's Psalms are his journal entries, Absolutely. as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And in that, he, he is starting many of his Psalms raging and angry and, and in anguish over something. And by the time he's finished, there's a voice of praise. Yeah. There's something that has changed in exactly. that process that we see exactly. in those Psalms. Yeah. Psalms 51 especially, and particularly since we that. talked about forgiveness in our last week's session, Psalms 51 is, is his journal entry of, of what took place after Bathsheba, Bathsheba and this baby that Uriah. died and Uriah and, and, and all of that grief and, and the guilt and the regret and his need for forgiveness. And, and he journals that there. It's the most beautiful psalm of repentance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. the steps yeah. of repentance are yeah. right there. Yeah. And it's beautiful. And I'm so glad that he was the manly king of Israel who did this because I hear from many men, oh, journaling's not for me. And, and again, our culture, it's like, well, crying's not for me. Our, our culture just inhibits the man from being able to, to grieve in healthy ways. Well, you know, and I will say, I, uh, 
although I teach that journaling is very effective if you're trying to press into the presence of the Lord, I always tell people you don't have to journal to pray to God because my husband is a man of prayer, but if he had to journal, he would not do it. However, I'm going to take that back as an exception. It's different when you are working through grief. Through grief. I see, mm -hmm. I mean, this just makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. We are on the same page mm -hmm. because this is something that anybody can do and should do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, you, if they were going to go to a counselor, uh, if they were going to a psychologist, they would give them lists of questions and pages to write out things because even uh, this, you know, psychology understands there's something about getting it out on paper, but how much more valuable when you are involving the Lord, you're addressing the Lord, the Holy Spirit then becomes your partner in helping you to pray to God and brings up things that you may not even be aware of. You know, it's something that's under the surface so he can get below skin level. Yeah. You know, another area of grief work involves taking care of your body physically mm. and being very intentional and very mindful about uh, not exposing yourself to things that would add more pain to you, uh, such as, you know, violent TV shows and the kinds of things that are, or, or, or loud and raucous music or, or things that would, would just add to that pain. It, it means making choices about an exercise program, uh, including exercise and, and making choices about eating well and sleeping well and drinking water and, and getting sunshine. We have access to these natural remedies as they're referred to, and they're there as a remedy for the broken heart as well as the physical body. But at what point can someone do this? Um, I started to say self-directed. Of course, you hope the Holy Spirit's involved because it seems to me this is a point, and I think next time you come, we're gonna talk about becoming good counselors to those who comforters, are grieving, right. comforters. But it seems to me that it, it would be very difficult to concentrate on your health or doing things in those first few months after, because so many people want to close in, want to uh, get go into the room, put the covers over the head and mm -hmm. not come out. At what point is this realistic to say, okay, you need to intentionally go out, take walks, get sunshine, get some exercise and eat well. People aren't thinking so much about themselves. I'm, I'm struggling here, but at what point do you think this actually becomes realistic? It's absolutely work? necessary in grief work. And here again, we've got to come back and ask ourselves, am I willing to endure the pain or the discomfort? Just as if I was doing physical therapy to restore this strength in this arm or the physical therapy for my broken leg, am I willing to give this a try? Am I willing to in be intentional? In my book, I have a whole section about the physiology of grieving with the recommendations of how to find and incorporate the physical grief work that we need to do to, to maintain our physical health. You see, if we let our physical health um, diminish in bereavement, we reduce the capacity to grieve in a healthy way emotionally because we're a whole body system. We're not yes. one or the other. And so one thing we can control, I can't control the wave of emotion that might come my way but I can control that I will go outside and take a 15 minute walk. That I can control. I can control that I will drink an X amount of glasses of good clean water. Those are things that we can control. So in a way, it's almost more realistic to um, suggest and consider taking on the physical steps of keeping our physical body healthy than it is to even consider the emotional steps. I'm kind of laughing over here because I have a hard time controlling that just in a regular, <laughs> you know, because we're just, you such work, you know, your workload. Work driven. Yeah, yeah. you're work driven. So yeah. I'm having, I mean, someone would have to literally walk me through those steps. And, and, and I do to... that a bit in the book so that people can yeah. go, okay, well, I could try this today. I don't have to do all of them, but maybe I could incorporate this piece yeah. of taking care of my physical body and see it as my part of doing my grief work. 
It, and, and yeah, it might be uncomfortable or unusual or different, but this is my grief work. This is the season to do my grief work. If I delay the season for my grief work, will it still need to be done? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I can put 10 years between it, 20 years before it, but the grief work will still need to be done if I want a healed heart. Yes. So whether it's the emotional work of working something through a journal or the physical work of taking care of our physical bodies, this is part of what grief work is. Amen. Yeah. There's more grief work. Okay. Okay. That comes on a cyclical basis, and particularly during the first year, when we encounter all of the firsts. The first birthday, the first anniversary, the first Christmas, Thanksgiving, Valentine's, Fourth of July, whatever were those favorite or unusual holidays, the season of the year that one would travel with their first spouses. First anniversary of the mm -hmm. death. First anniversary of the death. What do we do? That's the difficult one. Yeah, yeah, that is. I am definitely one to encourage people not to shove it under a rug, not to pretend um, that we really do our grief work, that we face it head on. And what we face head on early on, we never have to cross that as a first time again. Yeah. So. My husband and I really took that to heart. And we discovered that the anticipation of the first birthday and the first Christmas was far more painful. intense and painful than the actual arrival of that day. And so when you arrive at that day and you've made plans and preparations for it and, and you work through that day, you honor your loved one. and that day now ends. I don't ever have to go back and live that day again. Not that first one. Not yeah. that first one again, That's yeah. Right. And so, so the more I'm intentional for the first one, the second one is easier. Now, even in a healed heart, I visited my son's grave now, 30 years later, and did I weep? Oh, you bet. I will always love my son. Amen. Nobody will ever take that away from me. And is it sad that he's not with me? You bet. Has God healed my heart so that I can live and move and breathe among his creation and, and be of help to other people? Yes, he has. And he gets all the glory for that. Yes. Yeah, he does. So sometimes we think, oh, well, they're going to get over it. And if someone isn't crying or weeping or in depression or in denial, and they seem to be living life just fine, and we think, oh, well, they're over it. No, we don't get over it. It's not like a flu or a cold. We live as different human beings for the rest of our lives. When you lose a loved one, a spouse, a child, someone that's really close. Mm -hmm. The whole rhythm of life is changed mm -hmm. and it takes time to get into a new rhythm, but, but it doesn't mean that you forget. You don't just close the door mm -hmm. and shut this. It's, it's, it's something that's still there. You always remember that. But it is the fact that I can see where the grief work helps you get into a new rhythm. Can I just, I don't know how much you have left to say, but I just want to, I'm encouraged to share this scripture. It's Isaiah 61 and verse three. It talks about how God comforts all those who mourn and consoles those, he consoles those who mourn to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This is why it's so important to include God in this process. I mean, actually, I mean, to do it without him, I don't know how anybody goes through no. the grieving process without the Lord. Um, I, it's a comfort to us because we know that if our loved one is in the Lord, that's quite a comfort in knowing that we have eternity to live with them you know, when, when Christ returns. But what do you do 
in grief work, or do you address this at all? When, how do you counsel with someone, that maybe that's next program, when they, their loved one wasn't in the Lord? Oh, that's a completely different topic yeah. than yes. The, the, the short answer to that is that we've never been called to judge anyone's status one way or the other. Amen. That is not our calling. God has not entrusted that uh, piece of His kingdom life to us. And so what He has asked us to do is to trust Him. Amen. He's the only heart reader who honestly reads our heart and knows. So if someone is concerned about the, the future um, life of eternity with or without a loved one, I just encourage them that if you trust God, would you trust Him with that peace? Because He's the only one that knows. He knows best whether someone would live forever in joy with yeah. Him or they would hate having to live with Him. That's true. And so the Isaiah verse that you opened up to was exactly what I wanted to finish up with for oh. today. Oh. Because, you know, as, as we face those first and as we acknowledge and honor, uh, sitting at the graveside of my son is like a reset button for me. It resets what is truly important in this life and what is not. It's clear that the eternal realities are far more important than the temporary sufferings and problems and trials and et cetera that we might have. And so the, the idea that comes from Isaiah about how God's intention is to bring us to so much healing that the ashes of mourning, that, that's, yes. that's what you wear in mourning, the, the, the sackcloth of mourning, those are exchanged for a crown and, and for garments of praise and, and, and an oil of, of joy instead of you know, this despair of sadness. And so that's what God offers us, that's what He calls us to, is this much healing in our lives. And that's just a beautiful thing that if we're willing to cooperate with Him as my heavenly physician, my heavenly therapist, the one who knows my heart intimately and perfectly, that He knows how to take me step by step through my valley of the shadow of death, through it, not just into it to stay, but through yes. it, then I can look at this promise and know that it's for me. Oh, and that is such, you know, this is the thing about God's Word. There is such comfort and life. These words are alive and active. Thank you so much for being with us today, Karen, and we look forward to you returning next time when we were going to be talking how to be good comforters ourselves, how to comfort others. And for those of you who are watching, I know everyone has been through grief at some point in time in their life, and we know that if we're alive, we still have that possibility grief will be facing us. But please tune in next time so that we can see how we can be an extension of God's comfort to others. God bless.